and I'd, I'd like to thank, first start by thanking Kara and Roger and Sasha for having me today. It's really wonderful to be able to address this crowd. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. First, I'm going to talk about why typography matters. Uh, I doubt that very many of you need to be convinced of this, but I know you work with and you work for people who do, so maybe some of the things that I can show you today will help you talk about that. Then I'm going to take a little bit of a darker turn and talk about some of the things that have happened in publishing in the last year or so that you should be concerned about and maybe even worried about. And I want to offer up some thoughts on what we can do as designers and typographers in response to some of these things. So who am I to speak to you about this? I'm an assistant professor of communication design at uh, the New School's Parsons School of Design. Uh, I teach a publishing class there as part of the creative publishing program. So some of the thoughts that I'm giving you today will follow from that. Uh, I'm also the, and this is not going to work at all. OK, hold on. Uh oh. There we go. Okay, maybe now even this will work. Yes, okay. So, I'm also the uh, co author with Sue Apfelbaum of Designing the Editorial Experience. And this is a book that we wrote uh, about a year and a half ago where we interviewed about 20 different designers and technologists, and we also went through and did about 19 case studies in the book, everything from BuzzFeed to Gather. So the other half of what I will present to you today is going to be coming from that. But first, I want to go way, way back. Uh, we talk a lot about Gutenberg and how Gutenberg revolutionized type and how uh, setting type is such a big thing for us. Uh, we don't talk too much about the invention of newspapers, at least not in design school. And the, the invention of newspapers actually didn't happen until about 150 years later. So before this time, you had uh, people, people obviously told each other the news and wrote down the news, but it was one story at a time. And here you have two newspapers from Germany at the, at the left from 1609 and one on the right. This is from the Netherlands in 1619. And the, the two on the left, there was a, a big thing about which one was first for a long time, and then the one on the right is the first one in a broadsheet format. So there's always like this big battle of which one is first. But what is really interesting about these things is that they all actually have a previous uh, incarnation. The news used to come handwritten in these documents, and they would be posted in the cities. And I'm very interested in this idea that the handwriting itself was what would carry through to people whether or not the news that they were reading was something that they should believe. And later on, when you <coughs> uh, would get to newspapers, they would, they would actually be picking up from that. I should also mention that the 1600s are my favorite time period ever, ever, ever. This is Kepler, uh, Johannes Kepler in, um, in the Epitome Astronomiae Copernicanae. So this is his figure M, and it's showing the world as belonging to just one of any number of similar stars. So, and this is the period, the 1600s are when our whole view of the world changed forever. The idea that we were not at the center of it was really from that time. And I don't think it's a real coincidence that it, co it coincided with this idea of these periodicals and these newspapers of people regularly reading and communicating with each other in ways that were not just one off. So this was obviously banned by the Catholic Church. And then this one you may be a little bit more familiar with. This is Galileo Galilei, the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. He was found guilty of heresy. The book was banned until 1835. Um, and we haven't had another time like this until now, and I think we have yet to see what, what these changes, what the new paradigms for communicating, especially news and information over the web, have done. We're seeing it. You can feel it right now, but we haven't really been able to express in words yet what this is going to do to us. So, uh, so back to 1704. This is the first American weekly. This is the Boston Newsletter. 
Uh, my favorite thing about the Boston newsletter is that it is published by authority. Again, this idea that there has to be something visual to indicate that difference. I, and, and even the, the existence of that black letter, the fact that it has continued with us for so long, I think is, is, is a really important element. So what does this have to do with the present? So this is what our reading experience is for most of us most of the time. Uh, you will all find this very familiar, I would imagine. And the, the voice of the content, how the words are put together, how people actually, uh, what they mean, uh, the order of things, that's the first cornerstone of the identity of any one of these publications. But the second one is definitely typography. If you, the, 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 the typography of anything is just something that can actually express itself at every scale. It doesn't need a large scale to be able to speak in a certain voice. And you know, there are just, especially because you are so zoomed in, you are so close to this content, you have this ability to look and see that you're in a different place. So here you have uh, Wired, which is in, look at uh, what this is. Well this, there, well, this is type that was commissioned for the Wall Street Journal, actually, originally here in Wired. Over on the right, um, we have, late. It's Apre, modified version of Apre. And in the middle you have like very, not necessarily a, a, a unusual typeface, but you have this centering of the type up top and that drop cap that lets you know that it's Vanity Fair. And my point being, and this is a little bit to fo follow from Eduardo's talk from earlier, is that identity being able to understand what it is that you're reading all the time, that, that is something that is very much carried uh, by the type. So I'm going to show you three different uh, quick case studies to, to talk about that. Uh, we'll look at the New York Times. We'll look at Bloomberg Business Week and The Guardian. Uh, actually, New York Times, Guardian, then the Bloomberg then Bloomberg Business Week. So, and I know I just showed you what a disaster identity can be on mobile, but you d we do need to go back and look at print. Uh, you can't just start with the mobile site and say, okay, well, if we just optimize for that, that'll we'll be done with that. So this, these are, th the, I'm going to show you a couple of slides from Kelly Doe's redesign of the 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 paper paper, uh, the paper paper. By the way, I read every single day. It's like a very expensive and like very luxurious, wonderful habit. Um, and she did these redesigns in 2012, and you can see the coding of all these different sections and t headers and topics, and just understanding that all these different subtle changes are things that readers will learn and then be able to practice as they're, as they're reading through it. And in fact, I made, you know, had the sort of revelation of what, how much type mattered beyond just type choice when she came to one of my classes a few years back, and she was talking about uh, she was in progress with all this material, and she brought one of these one of these sheets, and she was showing us uh, images of that Science Times with the with the original round dot of the eye in Karnak, and then the the square dot that they had created, and and just asking the question of is it Timesian to have a round dot or a square dot, and it's just like this very specific question about this very specific thing, but in the end, you know, it is the right question to be asking at that moment. Also, one of the things that uh, I was delighted to find out, I don't know, years into reading the paper, is that if you're looking at the, the newsy news, it is generally fully justified. And then if you're reading opinion, it tends to be rag right. And once you figure this out, you actually start to read the paper a little bit differently. And you realize that all the different rhythms of reading in the paper are, are actually coding for you all the time the, the different things that you're looking at. And here you have uh, everything, but you know these are obviously placeholder headlines and images. One of the things that that I think is so important about editorial design is understanding that if you you're cr what you're doing is you're creating a frame that if you pull out all of the content, you replace it a hundred percent with something else, like not a single thing is repeated, that people still pick it up and say this is the same thing. Like I'm still picking up the New Yorker, I'm still picking up the New York Times. And that's where it's one of the most powerful places that design or type ever plays. In what other situation, like if you had a person and you changed everything about them, how would, how would you have them represent as the same person? It, w it just wouldn't be possible. 
And of course, like this also carries over to uh, the web. It's not just limited to the paper. It also gets much more uh, difficult. So this is the redesign from 2014 of the website for the New York Times. And looking at just how to incorporate all these new kind of things that they could do, the slideshows and documents and things. And ultimately, though, you're, you're still trying to figure out how do you go from this to this to this and still make it feel like it's the same thing? How do you make somebody say, no, that's an imposter, you know, not say, no, that's an imposter that is not the same thing that I'm looking at? Uh, even more complicated, how do you have the magazine online and still make it feel like it's the newspaper, but that it's the magazine and it's not the newspaper? How do you make sure that somebody reading a magazine article, because this was a problem until 2014, a magazine article was in the same article template as everything else, so it would just feel like the same type of thing when it was not. How do you make the um, iOS app uh, on the right and the mobile site that's on the left, how do you make these two things feel like the same thing when and have each one of them actually pick up on all of the, the, the design and innovation that they need in each one of those platforms? And how do you make completely new products that people are not familiar with and still make them feel like they're coming from the same place? So. Now, The Guardian uh, is not uh, 150 years old like the New York Times. It is 200 years old and makes really good use of Guardian Egyptian, which was uh, famously designed by Paul Barnes and Christian Schwartz uh, with Mark Porter, who was the creative director at the time. And it's, it's, a, it's also like a really great uh, story of how a relationship between a type, type designer and a, and a newspaper from print to web like has really uh, brought about this, this wonderful identity for this, for this paper. And you'll see many of the same <coughs> questions here. So you know, here, here is trying to differentiate and pull together similar things on the web. Here you've got the web and the app. Uh, the, the, the website, if you go to the website on the phone versus going to the app on the phone, uh, you can see how the type is actually kind of more refined in the app because there's more control over it. You know what size it's going to be. The website obviously is trying to also uh, optimize for every situation. And again, the web and the app, you can see again that thinner type for the app. And this is really where we are now in a lot of ways. It's there are situations that we can optimize for one type of reading and then other situations where we have to optimize for many types of reading and we'll get to that as well. And, and then here is Bloomberg Business Week. Um, so when my friend Sue and I wrote Designing the Editorial Experience, they had not yet redesigned online. We were only looking at the, the, the printed magazine. Uh, this la launched in January 2015, and uh, Richard Turley, who was the creative director at the time, he had commissioned a new digital version of Neue House Grotesque over here, uh, again by Christian Schwartz of Commercial Type. And like the Times and the Guardian, Bloomberg Business Week also has uh, subsections that, and I'm going to lose, it's probably a little bit later, but I, the, the text is actually Tiempo's text by Chris Sowersby, and uh, I do want to make a point here, though, that this is also Tiempo's used in On the Verge. It's not just, the, again, it's not just the type choice, it's how it is being used and what are all of its different relationships and what are, what are the relationships to the other type that's around it. Uh, in its subsections, you have Avenir for the logo and then the, the color changes, but you have so many of the same type decisions and relationships uh, down below. And here is the politics section also as an article page and as uh, in the mobile form. This is the mobile website. <coughs> and now what? So. Everything that I'm showing you or I've shown you so far is kind of the pinnacle in some ways of where we got to in, um, in, in, in type and on being on the web. These are moments that we had only dreamed about because for so many years, the internet actually tried uh, so, so hard <coughs> to be more like print. You know, you keep the copy tiny, you put it in columns, you put print, print ad type ads in there. Uh, no matter what, you keep everything above the fold. 
And it did this with just a handful of typefaces. Uh, browsers refused to support the same code. So it was all about these, these limitations that were there. By the time that we got to this, we had finally passed the point where, where the best thing the web could do was to be like print. We actually got to the point where the web could do things that you couldn't do in print, where you could actually have a different kind of experience that was breathtaking at times. And you know, the Times wasn't the only one to do this. There were so many other uh, people across the board, everything from Pitchfork to um, BBC, that, that really uh, took advantage of all these new characteristics that you had on the web to, to tie together these experiences. But this past year, things have really taken a turn. Uh, design technology isn't shaping the the online media anymore business models are. And publications tend to go where the advertising is and where the ad money is. And, and this was quite a year. So you see this guy? So he's not about to talk about new tools or new media. He's actually about to introduce built-in ad blocking for iOS. And he's also going to introduce a new news app to replace Newsstand, which everybody hated, probably rightly so. Uh, nobody loved it also because it was, this, it was still that old aesthetic of uh, how do we make something on the internet that looks like something we're familiar with in real life and just keep trying to get closer and closer to that until, every, until nobody cares. But the, thing, the special thing about the news app, though, was not necessarily a better experience. Uh, there was two special things about it. One was that it broke up all the news into articles and stopped dividing them by publications. The other special thing is that it integrated iAd, which is Apple's new uh, advertising, its own advertising system. Meanwhile, Facebook has been sidling up to publishers for some time. Uh, it started with a few selected outlets, and uh, then they opened them up to everybody so that everybody could do uh, the sharing. And right now, a lot of publications are, are actually making a lot of their income from this. And what about any of this constitutes a war? Well, it's a war because Google doesn't make its money from donations. Google makes its money from advertising. And Google's advertising is everywhere. So every single time that you see all these articles that are creepily close to what it is that you're searching for, well, that's, that's Google. Google owns DoubleClick for Publishers, which is vast. It's used by almost every single publication that you go to online. And it's even in native advertising. So it's like every single time that you see an ad randomly on the web, probably it's being served by Google. <coughs> so what's a publisher to do? So doubling down on design online, a lot of these publications that were asking the question of should we redesign our website decided instead to go to Medium. Some, some of them, uh, like Mike and Travel and Leisure, have still maintained their own websites and they just continue to distribute through Medium. Medium, I, for any of you who don't know, is, a, is what's called a platisher. It's a platform and a publisher all at the same time. Has wonderful features, um, it owned by Twitter. And one of, its, one of its, this is Mike on Medium, and one, one of the things that is amazing about it is that the uh, you know, it's quite beautiful. The text is clear, the typography is nice, the images are nice and big, everything is very well thought out. And it also does a pretty good job of figuring out what I want to read. It doesn't tell me a whole lot, though, about what it is that I'm reading, except for maybe a little bit of a, a space for a logo. So on the one hand, it's, it's amazing. So all of this content now can be everywhere. You can put it on Facebook Instant Articles, you can put it on Medium, you can put it on LinkedIn, you can put it on Snapchat. And your logo can follow all of this stuff, stuff over, uh, around. But on the other hand, it, it sucks because these platforms look like these platforms, and they're all just good enough type. And we do have to ask ourselves whether that's good. They're designed for maximum legibility across the maximum number of devices. And even when there's a little bit of control, there's really not much beyond the, you know, maybe you could choose from one of five typefaces, and you can put your logo in there. but Really, it's not that, not that much. So, and in all of these instances, the unit is the article and the, not the publication or the issue. So publishers instead, they are putting their money into chatbots and VR, uh, breaking apart content into as many little pieces as possible. Um, also, another, another concerning, highly concerning thing. So John Herman, who's now at the New York Times, he came over from the All uh, reported last year that advertisers 
uh, 85 cents of every new dollar spent in online advertising in the first quarter of 2016 will go to Google or Facebook. And so you got to ask the question of like, well, where was that money going before? And now, now, where, now where is it going? And what does that mean for these, for these publications? So if you are a publisher, between the ad war and this, this proliferation of very similarly optimized platforms, uh, investing more in making these interfaces or making them better seems like a really bad idea. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I can totally understand where, why publishers are kind of in a very wait and watch mode right now. So, and this is where I have my charge, it's time for my charge to you. So, I will say, if you're on a team that controls templates for platforms used by multiple publishers, here's your chance to give some thought to the importance of your readers being able to gauge the identity and credibility of what it is that they're reading. Um, even if it means that some of the interfaces are ugly. If you're a type designer, I would say rejoice because type is one of the first things that people allow for control over on these platforms. If you make custom type, rejoice even more because even with a gazillion fonts available, generally people stick to about six. And depending on what's cool in the moment, they don't want to have the wrong thing. So it really, I, I, I very much believe that people will continue to want their own typefaces, especially if that's the one thing they have control over uh, to differentiate from everything else that's out there. And if you're a designer, I'll, s I'll say, don't forget that this world is a bunch of overlapping systems. Uh, don't, and that's not just tools, but mediums, habits that change overnight. The better that you understand these systems, the more likely it is that you'll find the overlaps and the openings to make the great new editorial design that's still to come. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.